And I wanted to start by um, talking a bit more about this theme and some of the aspects of it. So just to sort of recap a little bit, the desire, um, this longing to belong, as John O'Donohue put it, it, this is completely natural in us. It's really useful to remember that, that belonging historically is key to our survival, that we had to belong to a tribe, we had to belong to a group of people that collectively set up the conditions that created shelter and food and community and safety. So that longing is innate in us, has really good foundation, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, a, it's a perfectly good longing. It's just coming into, the quest is more of coming into correct relationship with it. We're not trying to eliminate it or get rid of it. It's coming into a relationship with it where it leads us to happiness and is in concurrence with seeing the truth. As both of these are part of our innate wishes too, to be happy, and also to do it in a way that is aligned with truth on our personal integrity. So one of the key aspects of this right relationship is not getting confused, not getting confused that people or situations or groups of people, that they have to be static. They have to stay somehow that the same in order for us to feel some sense of security. You know, we, do, we don't want to rely that a, a family is going to stay exactly a particular way. People come and go, they change location, they change, people um, pass away. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen. You know, and you can feel this like if you sense you have a belonging to a group of friends. I've really noticed this over the years, belonging to a community. And then people move, people's circumstances change. They have children or they become a caretaker or uh, their work becomes something they need to tend to in a different way. And so the sense of relationship you have with people and the way you might have felt very sort of securely rested there might change. But the error there in that isn't that it changed. It's that you, when we get confused and think that our sense of security and belonging is dependent on it not changing. That's the confusion rather than the fact that it changes because everything changes, right? The Buddha was very clear on this, a Nietzsche, it's just going to keep changing. And so the, if we think our sense of belonging is, is going to come from some static permanent place, we're set up for, dis for, for disappointment. So be willing to, um, understand that this, our belonging has to keep being created. It's an activity and it's a uh, participation rather than a static noun that we can just lean into and this is the way it is in a permanent way. And so what we're looking for in our relation to this is how to find a sense of internal belonging of ease that allows us to participate in the in and flow, in and out flow, the reciprocity that is our relationship with the world. And so that we can recognize that inherent in this in and out flow of reciprocity in the world is where we can rest and find our belonging. Find, and you can feel in this that what we're finding is the resting without isolating into the separateness of self.
so this relaxation in our being and this sense of the in and out flow, as I talked about some yesterday, is not dependent on being the same as. It's not dependent on sameness. It's not dependent either on our being perfect, on our, you know, getting it right, that somehow it's so easy for us to get the idea that if I just am somehow do this, do this being ourselves, do this better, do it right, do it in a particular way, then it'll be better in some way that will allow me to have this sense of belonging. Somehow we think that if we're more perfect in some way, then we'll be included in this in and out flow in a way that's satisfying. We're already in that in and out flow. We can't actually get away from it. Changing, this is, you know, the Buddha was so clear on this. It's not about fixing this personality. It's about recognizing the goodness that is here, the integrity, the uh, potential, uh, the wholesome states that we can offer into this in and out flow. And so a very important part of this is recognizing the truth that is already here. And this is such, all of these are why we practice in order to see what's already here, to see that we are not dependent on somehow fixing this or being, being perfect or being the same as, or all these other ideas, many of which I'm not gonna go off on a big tangent here, but just to acknowledge that these are the result of causes and conditions that we've acquired from our families of origin and very strongly from our culture. The whole self-improvement project that our culture has just fed us in spades and that every, you know, every direction that it comes from, there is this idea that somehow I have to change and then I'll be included, I'll be happy, I'll be, you know, praised and, you know, my life will be all pleasure. And there's just such a deeply embedded set of beliefs there that we didn't ask for, we didn't create. They're just, they're being collectively created in our culture and we are the recipients of them. This, that's why it's a, very helpful to remember that this practice we're engaged in is radically subversive in that it's under, it's naming and saying that so much of what our culture uh, puts as the right way to do it is not what the, the Buddha pointed to as the way towards happiness and to freedom from suffering. So this practice, this, this understanding very much ties into that, recognizing that our participation, our belonging, our being in relationship in a not self flowing, not static relationship with the world is already here. And that's why we sit, to let the, the silt settle out of the water and see the truth of what's already here. And the more we let the silt settle, the more we have the possibility of expressing our goodness that is here and expressing the kindness that is here and participating in a way that is not reliant on some limited version of what it might be. I want to read you a poem from a Let's see if, it's, if I have it here. Yeah, this is uh, from Rosemary Watula Tromer, and it speaks, I think it's, you know, in this day and age, somebody brought up a question about political parties and stuff, I think, yesterday. And this idea that to belong, we have to uh, somehow be of the same views and opinions as somebody else. This is called United. Over 30 years later, 
I still return to the night when my brother and I stood in the kitchen and argued the merits of grape nuts versus Captain Crunch. Potassium, potassium, potassium. I still hear him chanting. The one nutrient his cereal had more of than mine. Breakfast was the least of our differences. But it taught us to laugh as we disagreed so that later when the stakes were higher, presidential elections and gun laws, we could argue till I cried, then snuggle on the couch. Though we seldom agree, though we will forever cancel each other's votes, though I will never eat Cap'n Crunch, I'll sit with him as he eats it, laughing, shaking my head, grateful, Grateful he teaches me so much about how I am not. He will celebrate me and buy me any damn cereal I want. Though we disagree about almost everything, except, except how much we love each other. We are two threads in a civilization that would try to make us believe we couldn't be one cloth, but we are. Woven tight, we are. So really beautiful description of the way we come to this place of belonging is not through some kind of sameness, but you could hear in that poem, a deep reciprocity, a deep care. And that belong, the places we can get our belonging are not in the personality, but more in this wholesome expression. So I wanna name, a break this down a little bit more, this wholesome expression. And you'll start to hear in here, um, many of the teachings that the Buddha was naming, pointed us to. And the first one, I mentioned this quite a bit yesterday, but to repeat it, is our we, a strong sense of this comes from our sila. Sila being the Pali word from our ethical conduct. That when we behave in a way that is aligned with ourselves and is expresses a care for those around us and for the world, that it comes with it, as the Buddha talked about it, the bliss of blamelessness. And he said the bliss of blamelessness was the highest bliss available in relation to the, you might say the conventional world. In other words, not the bliss of, um, insight into wisdom, but in relation to, he, and he's pointing to how this is a much higher bliss in the physical world than a, a mere pleasure, uh, you know, a good food or a, um, you know, some sort of pleasant sight, that the bliss of blamelessness and that this relaxation of our system. And if you think about how much of our time um, we can spend cogitating about, did I do that right? Did I do that okay? Is somebody upset with me? Oh, I should have done it differently. And that can even in its, um, in a, its very unskillful form be a lot of self-judgment and self-criticizing. And part of the invitation of the precepts is to align with not doing harm. And then through that recognition of not doing harm, to relieve ourselves of that internal dialogue of self-criticism and self-judgment. And to see how that is extraneous. That some desire to do it a little differently. Okay. 
excuse me, I'm so glad there's a mute button so you didn't have to hear that. Um, so being able to be in alignment and letting go of the idea of that somehow we're supposed to do something more, better, different, and recognizing if we're in alignment with our integrity, that then we haven't strayed. And yeah, we can make a choice here or make a choice there. You know, God, our lives are so full of choices and we can say, oh, I don't know what to do. But really, most of the time, if we're in integrity, if we're in the sila, they're all good choices. It doesn't really matter. You know, you do one thing or you do the other one. Wait and see what happens as long as you stay in alignment with the, to the best of your knowledge at that time, not causing harm. This, uh, this also allows life to be much more of a, the preciousness and the adventure of life rather than a living in fear that the next thing that you do is somehow going to be a cause for self-criticism. So that's to speak about sila and yeah, there's more I could say, but I'm going to leave it there. Okay. And then the next thing I want to um, mention as the way that this belonging is cultivated is through connection. So, and we sometimes think that connection should come to us. And there's another way to view it is to understand that connection is part of what we offer. It's part of our participation. There's a story I really uh, like about a, a man that I know. He went to, this happened some time ago, but he went to, some, somebody said, hey, why don't you come to these dances of universal peace? And if you're not familiar with it, it comes out of the Sufi tradition. It's a dance, uh, sort of just a collective dancing form. And, um, and it's very social and community oriented. And he, I, I had been invited. Let me, I'll backtrack. I had been invited to come to this and someone I knew was there was being a musician. I was like, okay, I'll go. So I came in the front door and there was a man there who I knew slightly, but I didn't really know him. And he came to me and he said, oh, welcome. Come on in. Um, you know, you can put your coat over there. There's some drink and snacks over there. We'll be starting in about eight or nine minutes. Um, and when we start, you could just go into the circle. It's okay that you don't know what, you know, that you don't know about this. We'll tell you as we go along. And um, yeah, so make yourself at home. I was like, oh, okay, great, thank you. So I went and did it. Later, when I was sort of hearing about the uh, community and asking my friend, I said, oh, and what, what is his role? Does he, and so finally, actually just, they were like, well, no. so I went to him and I said, oh, so what's your role? Are you a leader here or are you, you know, you were greeting me at the door telling me, he said, no, I just, the first time I came, I, I, there wasn't somebody there and I wish somebody had oriented me. So I just appointed myself that that's my job to welcome people as they come in the door and tell them where to go. And it was such, and, he, and he, then he did say something like, and I really enjoy it. And I, I enjoy being part of the community. And it was such a beautiful expression of that he decided to become part of the community by participating in it, by offering what he saw needed to be offered. And it was, he created his own very clear sense of belonging by offering it to others. Very, very... Um, clear example of this. An, another one that um, 
I've participated in here is our community here in Moab has this annual Thanksgiving dinner that is just completely available to everybody. It's freely offered and it's a big thing. And I went to it once and I sort of like, you know, uh, it's not exactly the kind of food that I prefer. And I got it and I sat with some people and I talked and that was fine. And it was like, that's okay. That's nice. Then, and I said, well, you know, I like the idea of this, but so the next year I instead went and participated and went and, you know, helped. And actually when I participated, the only job left when I called was to do cleanup because that's like the least desirable job. And it was like, it was wonderful. I had so much more fun cleaning dishes and picking up stuff, trash than I had um, sitting at the table. And the next year I went to do that and um, I called up too late. And even though I called up earlier than I had the year before, and all the job, they were like, oh, we have so many volunteers. And it makes sense, doesn't it? That like to actually be a participant in it is what gives the sense of uh, belonging, of ease, of being in the in and out flow. So we're there in all of these, we're being involved in this dynamic expression of the heart. We're not looking for some static final position, but we're letting that heartfulness come out in us. And if you, as you probably all know, in the teachings of the Buddha, the very first teaching he gave to communities as he would go to them, as he would walk in on his bare feet with his troop of uh, monks in tow, was the teachings of generosity, of dana. And when you start feeling into what I'm talking about here, you realize, oh, he was inviting everyone to be a participant in this dynamic in and out flow that breaks down the isolated sense of self and creates this uh, feeling of participation. And therefore through participation, a sense of belonging. Thich Nhat Hanh picked this up at one point, you may have heard his teaching uh, about if you're angry with someone, and what happens when you're angry with someone, right, is you get the, the eye and the other gets very, very sharp. There's a boundary. There's like a, you are out there and I'm in here and the separation. And he very wisely has this whole teaching around, if you're angry with someone, give them a gift. And he even talks about like having a little storehouse of gifts available so that if you get angry at someone, you can give them a gift. And again, can you feel the brilliance of this suggestion? Because when you give someone a gift, there's this opening of the hand. There's this reconnection that's happening, this offering that the physical thing is just a... Um, a vehicle for the opening of the heart and allowing yourself to connect. So the, and that opening of the heart, for those of you familiar with the, um, with the Pali words, the, the generosity, we often talk about it as Donna, but that's the expression of the physical thing. This opening of the heart is called Kaga. It's, can you feel how there's generosity in terms of the physical, but there's the heartfelt sense of it. And the kaga of opening out your hand and offering it creates this flow and reciprocity of, of goodness and of connection. 
there's in our practice, I've, I've spent some time over the years in Bhutan with, uh, and through that, the, Bhutan is a country where the Buddhist practice has been practiced intact for like 11, 1200 years, or 1100, yeah, 1200 years with no colonial uh, occupation. So Bhutan has never been occupied by a colonial power. So there's a continuity of the Buddhist practice. And the primary experience there is you just feel the generosity everywhere in every aspect. And one um, a small place that my um, guide and friend there that I've come to know over the years, early on before he was, he was a surveyor and a young man and didn't have a lot of money, but a friend of his wanted to go on the classic three-year retreat and didn't have the resources to do that. And so he asked my friend, Nam Gay, if he would be able to help with that. And so Namge said they sat down together and they figured out like how many pounds of rice that would be and how many pounds of beans. That's probably all it was, was rice and beans. Um, so it's a little simpler than our version would be. And he was like, yeah, I can do that. And so he, um, and so he supported this person to go on a three-year retreat and supplied the rice and beans for him to do that. And what the reason I'm telling the story, though, is because the delight with which Namge, you know, by, by now it was probably 20 years later, but the delight with which he shared this story and how great it was that he had supported this person on their three-year retreat and how he felt like a participant in that practice, in the person's practice, and felt how he had offered something that wasn't, that hadn't just ended there. It was like in this whole in and out flow. We do this in our communities lots of times when someone is sick or someone, if has a loss, that we all step up and offer this, this gift of uh, feeling our connection. And it's actually one of the amazing um, gifts of, you know, we, all, we often have a sense of generosity and we don't get to express it. And somehow when people are sick or there's a loss or something happens, then it's, we're allowed to express it. And the person who has that feels the, because of our cultural things, it's still hard sometimes, but they're able to receive it. So there's an opening of these channels of giving and receiving and connection. I, I had a direct experience with this at one time when I had cancer and I couldn't believe the outflow of cards and well-wishing and offers to cook meals. And, and I was like, gosh, I had no idea this was here. And I realized I'd participated it in the other direction, but had never been on the receiving end. And it's like, oh, these connections are here. And we don't even know they're there until they, they get activated in some way, but they are already here. And we are forming these connections all the time through a simple smile, through making a phone call when somebody, when we or someone else wants connection, through the many ways that we participate with others. And sometimes it's direct, uh, person to person. Sometimes it's through some other offering or channel, but it's going on all the time. And this flow of generosity and reciprocity. 
is the active expression of this belonging. So the last place that I want to name that the specific of cultivating and feeling this embeddedness and the reciprocity is in the elements and the natural world. I spoke some about this yesterday and we practiced with it with the earth of feeling our, this body as being made of this earth and the elements practice in general with the, with water and with understanding that the air we breathe and the fundamental reciprocity of that. One moment, excuse me. The moment the reciprocity is including the germs we spread around. So I seem to have gotten somebody else's. Do I need to thank them for sharing? I'm not sure. <laughs> so this reciprocity of breath, of body, of fluid, the water flowing through us. And so that's the element aspect, but also there's an ongoing relationship with the world around us, with if you tend to a plant, if you have a garden, if you have a yard, if you go out into the wilderness and you are in relationship with that place. If you haven't read Robin Wall Kemmerer, I highly recommend her. Her book has become quite popular called With Braining Sweetgrass. And she has a wonderful place in there where she's talking about the incredible potential in having a garden and feeling the reciprocity of, of that relationship to the natural world and and she has this particularly beautiful description at one point and you can tell her delight when her daughter recognizes and tells her that her garden loves her because we always have this idea oh i can love my garden but we don't feel the reciprocity of it. And in her indigenous lines and in her indigenous wisdom, she really points to how it's a reciprocal relationship. And we can learn to feel that and recognize our embedded belonging in that. I noticed for myself one way that I um, started expressing this a few years ago, after I'd spent a lot of time outside and on retreat outside, is I would wake up in the morning and just like just sort of in that phasing into um, awakeness phase, I would just feel myself sending out love and appreciation for everything around me, for all the living beings and plants and and it would just be, it was the way I would wake up into the world. And I, you, can, you can try it. Because when you do that, you step into the world already part of it. You've started out the day in this active participatory offering in the world, this creating of what it is we so deeply want, this kindness, this being in alignment with ourselves and being in this reciprocal relationship. And in we're doing, as we do this, that particular practice or any of these that I'm naming, we are participating actively and consciously, mindfully in the truth of our inner connection. The inner connection is already here. And we're choosing to actively participate in it. 
to recognize it, to feel it in our hearts. And in this, we can feel the truth of our belonging. So I'll, I'll read you a well-known poem, though, that speaks to this so perfectly from Mary Oliver called Wild Geese. And you can hear in this very much what I've been talking about. Even if you've heard this poem many times, see if you can hear the, the belonging in it. She says, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So, thank you for your kind attention. And if you need to stand up for a second or stretch, please do, and then we'll sit together. <laughs> 